is a comfortably zoned radio network production. Okay, welcome back to the uh, Retro Rangers podcast. I am your host, George Grimm. And I'm here this evening with um, my friends, Mark Weissman and Rich Isaac. And we're going to be talking about um, the Rangers' recent uh, uh, free agent signings. Uh, all right, gentlemen, thank you for coming. Good Thanks to be here. Us, yep. So how do you think uh, our Blue Shirts did in the uh, free agent spree? Well, go ahead. You can go first. Sure. I mean, I think overall they did pretty well given the <clears throat> limitations <clears throat> with the salary cap. Um, ironically, the one guy I'm a little worried about is Jonathan Quick. Not because of his age, but because of his goaltending style. He's okay. pretty aggressive, you know, makes that first save, and really, at this point in his career, has to rely on his defenseman to clean up any rebounds. Right. You know, think a goalie from a few years ago who played for the Bruins, Tim Thomas. Um, what made him so effective was he was very aggressive, made that first stop, but at that time, the Bruins had defensemen that would clean up the rebounds. Right. It's not exactly well, I mean, the Rangers' I, strength. You know, Please, go I, ahead. I, I, that's a, no, that's a good point. You're right. I mean, as far as them, you know, in their own – that's one of the areas the Rangers definitely struggled with was, you know, in their own zone, especially on D at times. But, I mean, for one thing – well, I guess the first question is, Given all what you just said, how would you compare, I mean, him versus Halak? I mean, do you think it's an upgrade or a downgrade or about the same, or what do you think there? I don't know that it's an upgrade. At one time in his career, absolutely, I would have said it was an upgrade. But, you know, Halak is a traditional butterfly goalie. Um, and... I've got a little insight into it as my son was a goalie. Um, and it's part of it is the style, right? I mean, a, but, a true butterfly goalie, they're blocking. Yes, it's good to be athletic, but if you're not terribly athletic anymore, it's good to be big. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm, that's right. And because you can't teach size in blocking off that net. Um, and Quick was always a very athletic goalie. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yep. And he's not a kid anymore. <laughs> no, that's for sure. Well, I guess if, if you're saying then it's, okay, he's definitely not what he was. We all agree on Correct. that. Correct which is why we're paying him what we're paying him. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. So, so, but if you say, let's say he's as good or, you know, in the same ballpark as Halak, and, and when I say Halak, I'm talking Halak in like the second half of the year, obviously, you know, when he played really well. Right. Um, okay. So you have, you say, even if you say that's a wash, but then you've got the whole, one of them has three cups and the other one doesn't. So. Absolutely. You know, I think I think that's a. I mean, I don't want to overweigh that. You know, because you still have to. And the other thing is, quick, quick is the backup. You know, if we were signing him as our starter, I would say, you know, that could be a problem or more of a problem. But and the other, but you know, I guess the other thing is to your point, if if he's really aggressive, let's say he's a lot more aggressive than Igor, relatively speaking. You know, that can be a major adjustment for everybody on the team, forwards mm -hmm. and defensive. You know what I mean? If it, I mean, you, I mean, rarely, I guess, do you have two, two goalies on the same team who have, who have you know, identical styles. But um, so that, but depending on the contrast between the two of them, I mean, Igor can be pretty aggressive, obviously, though he's younger and quicker, you know, no pun intended. He's, uh, you know, yeah. he can, he can, you know, he can, he can come out and make a save and then recover a lot faster probably than quick can at his age. Yeah. 
so so from that point of view, you know, like guys like Truba and uh, and Miller and those kinds of guys are, are are used to you know looking to their right and their goalie is you know almost in the slot at times, <laughs> you know, yeah. as opposed to right, as opposed yeah. to somebody like like Hank who used to stay in the crease pretty much most yep. of his career. Even even when Hank you know got older, I always thought it was interesting. He never really modified his style um, yeah. to to come out to come out more. He pretty much. And you know, and he did okay, pretty much you know, right to the end. So, so, um, so I think if you look at that, if you say, okay, we're not getting the Jonathan Quick of you know the 2000s, but we are getting or 2100s, and and you know we, we are getting you know a decent backup. But then you have all of that. You know, you may not even see it during the regular season, but you know, once the playoffs come around, I'm sure I, you got to think that when you know. When the pressure's on, or when there's game situations, or when, between periods, or whatever it is, uh, you never know what what's going to click that that quick has been through. That he just has to, you know, nudge Igor and say, "Hey, you know, this this is probably going to happen next period. I've seen it before. We saw it in the finals against whoever. I won't mention any names. And uh, <laughs> you, you know what I mean? And you know that kind of thing. So, so I, absolutely." I, I think, if he was a downgrade, if you're saying, okay, we're getting a guy with all these experience, but his game has suffered, that'd be a different story. But I think it's, you know, for for, for a backup and for, you know, for the role he's expected to play, um, that being equal and then to have all that experience, you know, championship experience, I, I think that's it's a good thing. It's a good Again, thing. I, I think while I said <laughs> he's the one I'm concerned about, Yes, he can help Igor with the mental side of the game, absolutely, mm-hmm. in the high-pressure situations. He's been through it. He's lived through it and come out mm-hmm. the other side with mm-hmm. success. So, absolutely. The other thing we haven't discussed is with the new coach, they should be playing a far more structured game. Totally agree. I've been thinking that so, from the very beginning. Absolutely. absolutely. So that is a help for a guy like Quick. Obviously a help for a guy like Igor too, but since we're talking, we happen to be talking about Quick. But anyway. Yeah, I think cool. about, you know, some, some, go ahead, George, you wanted to say something? No, 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 that was a good point. Yeah, the, the one thing I was thinking when you said that, because I have been thinking about, you know, the Laviolette effect and what that's going to have on, you know, even if the exact same roster com- came back, um, you know, how it would change. I think I think that structure that you're talking about is is going to help guys like, you know, Miller, you know, just signed his bridge deal, but there's still a lot of concerns from a lot of people about, you know, him, him defensively. Offensively, I think there's no concerns, really. Um, so you have somebody like him. You know, we, we, we've talked about Panarin a lot, you know, with the playoffs and even during the regular season. You know, I could, I could see guys like that um, sort of shoring up their games uh, under Laviolette. I, I don't know why. Maybe that's wishful thinking on my part. Um, but I feel like – I just feel like, you know, that's going to become – you know, they're going to be able to play their own game the way they, you know, use their strengths but just be a little more cognizant and a little less high risk, you know, in the case of Panarin's. Panarin's uh, case, of, you know, under Laviolette. And I think that's going to help the goalies. It's going to help other, def- you know, defense pairings and all that. So I think, and some of these other creators that they sign, there's a lot of bottom six sort of defensive oriented guys that either they're going to make the team, you know, they're, they're, you know, which means they're good enough to make the team or they're going to push other guys to beat them to then, you know, be a, sec- a third line center, a fourth line center and, and you know, which means you know, it's it's better from that standpoint. So right. Okay. What about Wheeler? What do you think he fits in? I, I can. I'll go first if that's okay, Rich. Um, Absolutely. Um, well, I think he's a he's a wing, he's a right winger and he's a solid right winger. So I mean, I think I think off the bat, it's not unreasonable to assume that he's going to be in the top six on the right side. Right. Um, I've seen all kinds of permutations <laughs> from not just fans, but, you know, uh, reporters and about, you know, which, who was he going to play with? Um, it all depends. A lot of it depends on what's going to happen with 
um, Lafreniere, I think, in some cases, um, you know, where he's going to slot. Uh, Kako, obviously, is, is probably a top right wing, but whether he's, he's on the top line or the second line, let's say, um, is still up for debate. Um, so I think I think there's still some, you know, this, it, that's the, the exact mix and the exact lineup is going to probably have to shake out during training camp with Wheeler, um, as well as the rest of the, the roster. But I guess the thing is, the thing that I like about him is he's big. Okay, he's not just a right winger. You know, he he can he he had what like seven? I looked at his stats: seven consecutive twenty goal seasons with Winnipeg. Um, so he's not, you know, he's not going to blow your doors off necessarily. Uh, although I can't think off the top of my head, maybe he has, has he played, let's say he plays with Panarin, you know, um, now I know they both can kind of at times be now a, a, both a pass first type of player, but, but, you know, if, if, if not, if Wheeler gets into more scoring mode, you know, maybe his numbers go up just from playing with Fred. So that's, that, that could happen because that's, you know, you look at stats, of players who we signed and, you know, traded for, and you, you think about, you know, well, whatever they did is one thing, but a lot of it depends on who they played with, you know? So, so I could see Wheeler, but, you know, he adds that just big size, you know, if he could be a 20 or even a 30 goal scorer and, you know, be go into, go in front, get some, you know, dirty goals and, and that kind of thing, and just kind of be tough in, in their face, especially that's a playoff kind of player you want. Really, and you know, other than his age, you know, I mean, the only other he was captain in what for like seven years, also in in Winnipeg. Although I was reading more about, I guess, what happened when they they took his captaincy away, um, which apparently happened because he requested to be traded out of Winnipeg. Um, but his quote, if, if I could, George, I actually thought this was a really interesting quote from him. If I could read it, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. It said, you know, sort of some of it's sort of stock answer, you know, I don't need a letter on my jersey, what he said. There's a time in my career when he needed that. It was validation. I don't need that anymore. I'm really looking forward to watching the guys, you know, the Winnipeg guys at the time that I watched grow up have and step into an expanded role. If you think this is because – you think that because of this, I'm just going to fade in the background and not be a leader on this team, you're sorely mistaken. <laughs> I was like, man. And they still traded him, you know, but I think maybe that had a lot to do with bonus. I guess he, he took a poll in the locker room or something, and, and you know, a lot of the guys had moved past him being uh, – Wheeler being captain. But I don't know. I just – I kind of read that. It seemed very non – it wasn't like a sort of a politically correct way of putting things. I thought it was really kind of a bold statement to, to describe himself, which I thought was cool. So you get that, plus a guy who's big, and he's been an all-star. He was nominated for the Messier Award. You know, I mean, he's he's got a lot of things going for him. So I I really like you know I, I like what he brings and and where he play. I thought that signing was a good one. Yeah, for all the reasons cheap, you outlined. Yeah, he's pretty cheap he, too, so that's good. He's what? He's he's pretty cheap. He's oh yeah, right. that's on, on that yeah exactly. Cap, that's cap, true. Uh, yeah. You're right. To, to get all this, to get everything that I just talked about for, you know, that amount of money is, is, is pretty good. Any any potential knocks, you know, that you see, Rich? Like anything you're concerned about with him? Besides no, I, I, you know, the, the only question is foot speed. Because, you know, the, the Rangers have gone from at one point play, being a very fast team. They're not a very fast team anymore. Um, you know, the younger guys they have, none of them are speed burners. Right. Um, so th that's the only concern. But by the same token, you know, they didn't have just um, fast skaters when uh, Alain Vigneault was the head coach. They moved the puck quickly. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. And if they have good structure in the defensive end, it's easier to get out of your own end quicker. Mm -hmm. So time will tell. No, I mean, I, I thought that was a good signing. The fact that with his age, he's on an over 35 one-year contract, contract 
like Quick with performance bonuses, and the performance bonuses aren't onerous at all. Um, no, I thought that was a great signing, actually, given what yeah. budget Drury had. No, no, no. Yeah, right. Actually, I would, I, would, I would call that a good signing, even if he didn't have any. But, I mean, better, you know, in a way, um, it was a little bit, it was almost like, it's almost like what happened with, you know, when the salary came, you know, salary came in, salary cap came in. Um, yep. It prevent, you know, it prevented teams like us, really, and say, that, you know, back in the say their days of, just going out of the, you know, we have the most money, so we're going to get what we consider the, the best players, which didn't always work. But, well, if, but the, if, if if you recall, when Sather was still running the show in Edmonton, he said, infamously said, if I had New York's budget, I'd win the cup every year. Well, right. then he came to New York and had the budget <laughs> and won nothing. So, and he didn't even make the playoffs the first, the first five or six years. He didn't even make yeah. the playoffs. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so it's I think, not I think this, this how much. Yeah. It, it's not – yes, I agree with you, Mark. The salary cap forced a guy like Sather to have some discipline. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, anyway. Yeah. Yeah, what I'm saying here is just that I think Wheeler, for you know, what you're getting for the money is, is a good deal regardless if that was all the money Chris had to spend or not. You know what I'm saying? It's like, like – Yeah. It's just a good – it's just a very cost of – not even cost effective, just a very prudent signing. You know, it's just like here's a guy who could potentially bring a lot in a lot of different areas that this team is lacking. Um, and, uh, you know, you don't have to spend a lot of money for it. I mean, that just sounds like, you know, you, like if they had other, if they had more money, then they would just go after other players. But at least in this case, they would get him hopefully anyway, kind of is what I'm well, trying to say. Absolutely. And, in fact, in reality, you could make a case that, Wheeler would have been a good signing at twice the money. Yeah, exactly. That's right. That's right. So, anyway. Okay. Um, as, far, as far as some of the other guys, you know, uh, forwards, Benino, Pitlick, they'll, they're, these are basically fourth-line guys, and uh, they play that role very well. And Benino, after my comment about speed, despite being 35, he's not slow. He's still pretty quick. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah. he'll be perfect as that fourth line center. Yeah, he's yeah. like uh, he's about he's about the same age as McTavish was when we got him. He would be like a quicker McTavish with faceoffs and fourth line center and just a smart player. I mean, plus yeah, again, he also has. Cup experience, you know, two cups and stuff. Yep. The um, the uh, combination of uh, Wheeler, Quick, and and uh, Benino actually sounds like a law firm. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, right. good call, dude. That's right. Well, the other the other sort of amusing thing when you look at this, you know, Chris Drury grew up in Trumbull, uh, yeah. won, won and won a cup, and uh, now he's got no let you know, Quick went to uh, grew up. Right near me, actually, in Milford, Connecticut, uh-huh. went to Hamden High School. Uh, went to Avon Old Farms Prep School, which is the same prep school that Leach went to, and also Leach Canada went to. Yeah. And then, and then Benito grew up in Farmington, Connecticut. So it's like not all, It's one thing to be like a lot of times an American-born GM or a coach will brought American-born you know players. Like that sometimes happens, but this is not. This is like. You know, a Connecticut fest, <laughs> you know, with your GM yep. being from from the area. I don't think that's a coincidence at all. Um, you know, they just, for whatever reason, they might know more about them or they know about the programs. I mean, I know all of that was way before their NHL career. You know, these guys have been in the league for a long time. But, but um, you, know, you, you just never know. It's like, it's like, you know, if you knew, if you were really close with somebody in high school, you could have 30 years go by and you might feel like, you know, no time has passed kind of thing. And, and remember, when Quick was growing up, his favorite player was Mike Richter. Mike Richter. Oh, speaking of which, I actually read a very interesting nugget about that. Uh, Jonathan Quick is now the all-time leader in shutouts for American goalies. And okay. guess, guess, who, guess, who, guess who he passed? 
to achieve that. <laughs> I would assume was, Mike Richter. It, it was. I didn't know Richter was the all-time American shutout leader before that. Before right. I had no idea. This was up until last year. This only happened last year. And the other ironic thing is Quick is now second all-time in American wins, and he just passed John Van Beesbrook. <laughs> so, wow. So you've got, you know, two former Rangers having been passed by Quick in different two different categories. I thought that was pretty wild. Yep. So let's see. On defense, them signing Gustafson, mm -hmm. that was a no-brainer. That was insurance. A guy with NHL experience has played for La Violette before. Mm -hmm. He'll be a perfect left-side defenseman to play with Schneider. Yeah. Um, now, I have a question. We talked about this, I think, on the last show. Um, yeah. Because before before the signing, you know, we were kind of pegging Jones to be that sixth defenseman. Do you think it's a given that Gustafson is already, you know, in the sixth slot and Jones will be like a seventh guy, or, or what do you think? I, I think Jones will either be the number seven guy, but we'll get some games. They'll definitely mm -hmm. give him a look. Okay. Um, yeah. He, from what I understand, he really worked on his defensive game last year to try and improve in his own zone. Because mm -hmm. let's mm -hmm. face it, he's like Fox. He's not a big guy. Right. But exactly. Fox is so good positionally. Exactly. Right, right, exactly. That the size doesn't really enter into it. And from what we saw, especially in the playoffs, Fox, despite not being a six foot one, six foot two guy, he's quite strong. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I think so, I think he has to. If he's going to be sort of elite long term, Fox. I mean, um, I think yeah. he's got to add that. I mean, the same thing happened with Leach. I mean, he was pretty much an offensive. He was solid, obviously, but he got more physical and more aggressive defensively and things like that as his career. I mean, either either on his own or because he, you know he got a lot of crap from it. People would just you know call him like just an, you know, an offensive juggernaut well, who could, you know, and that was not true, obviously, but definitely, I mean, he's that back when you could throw hip checks without getting called for a penalty, yep. you know, Leach was doing that all the time. So he just, he definitely had, I think he, it was underestimated. And I think I thought about too with Jones, like he, uh, you know, like you said, he really can't, he's not in a position really to be physical. I don't think, I mean, anything's if it's center of gravity, you never know, but, but yeah, he's, he needs to. I, I saw him play. I went to one of the Wolfpack games last year, and yep. two, two. He had two pretty egregious giveaways during the game. I remember thinking mm -hmm. there was only there was only a few guys that I knew, you know, from having played for the Rangers. And uh, I was thinking, wow, because because I remember liking, you know, when he played for us, he seemed pretty solid. And I figured, well, he must be kicking butt down there. And uh, he was still kind of struggling, you know, with that part of the game. So. Yep. Okay, yeah, where are the guys like uh, the guys like uh, Tyler Pitlick and Riley Nash, who are both both centers, fit in? I think Nash is going to play in the minors again, like he did last season. Okay. He he didn't get a sniff in the NHL last season. Yeah. Because I I mm -hmm. look at the, looked at that earlier, um, and. You know he he's he's a third fourth line guy. He's insurance policy. Um, right. The last time he had really what you would call a full season in the NHL was nineteen twenty with Columbus. Had sixty four mm -hmm. games. You know fourteen points total. He's yeah. he's a plugger. Yeah, well, it's interesting. I think if he uh, if we didn't sign um, Bonino, um, you know, he might be the guy that we're talking about for that, you know, you yeah. know, fourth line. So, you know what I mean? I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know if he's. I mean, he's not as good. I don't think. He doesn't have the pedigree, I guess. But I was reading some things about him. Well, first of all, I know Riley Nash. He went to Cornell in the in the two thousands, and I remember watching yep. him there and he played with they actually played with Colin Greening um they were on a line together and they yep. uh, and then I remember him and then it's sort of like 
I don't remember a lot about him until he played, you know, some, some game, certain games with Carolina. But when he played for Boston, he actually he actually played with Dominic Moore in Boston. I was reading that. Yep. And Bergeron got hurt, and he was on the top line with Marsha. Um, so mm-hmm. you know, you know, so it's you know, it's again a lot of time has passed but since all that's happened. But you know, the fact his is, best year in Boston, he only had 15 goals. Yeah. Yeah. You know, 41 points. That's probably, I if if I say. Um, that was the year Bergeron got hurt. Well, that could be every season the last eight years. <laughs> you know. Yeah, that's right. He so, also had a, he had a pretty bad injury. I guess Tory Crew took a shot and cut it. He got a cut on his ear. He got like forty stitches or something like yeah. that. Yeah. So you know he's he's played. If you look at there's like a theme. A lot of these guys were getting you know. A, this is Nash's eighth team with the, now with the Rangers, and some of the other guys, you know, played seven, seven. I think Benino's played for seven teams, so you know that's you can look at that, you know, as lots of experience, or you know they can't stick around. So it depends well, how you look at. It. <laughs> I, I would say that these these a lot of these guys are just classic, you know, bottom of the lineup guys. Right. 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 They're they're the guys you get in a in a transaction because you need a body to plug in. Right. Uh, they're, they're not terribly expensive. I mean, there's no risk in having Nash as an insurance policy. Right. He he's he's bigger than Lecision. He's got far more NHL experience than Brzezinski. Um. So, yeah. There's again uh, an insurance policy. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I got to think Ben Harper winds up in Hartford or on somebody else's team. Yeah, I was thinking that too. Um, unless they unless they decide to trade Jones, I mean that's a possibility, I guess. Absolutely. I mean, let's be realistic. They may have signed him specifically so they right. get something back for him right. because now he's on a contract where he signed for what. Two years. Mm-hmm. He's yeah. got cost certainty for this season and next, so that could be yeah, for that he, uh, too. He probably has more of an upside than uh, than Harper, so the Rangers would be able to sell that to another team and Absolutely. get more for him. You know, right? Yep. It's kind of a double-edged sword. He has more of an upside, so we should keep him. But he has more of an upside. His value just right. trade. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And if it were three years ago, I'd say absolutely. But, you know, we're in Mr. Dolan has demanded go for it mode. <laughs> Gee, what is you know? <laughs> Wow. You know, somebody's whispering sweet nothings in his ear. Yeah, yeah and we no, all know who that is. Yeah. The man behind yeah. the curtain. Yeah. yeah, exactly. All right. Absolutely. So how about, how about the kid? Where does this leave uh, – Will Cooley and uh, and uh, and uh, Brennan uh, Othman. Othman. Where does it go? Leave those guys. Well, I I think Othman, unless he blows their socks off in training camp, is starting in Hartford. Um. Simply because to get him reps, the last thing you want with a kid is him sitting in the press box. Right. Um. Cooley last year started slowly but really came on as the season went on and had an outstanding playoff run for Hartford. So mm-hmm. he, he's the guy who I think might have a chance of making the team out of training camp. It's not that I have my doubts on Ottman because I think Ottman eventually will be on the NHL squad. You know, oh, yes. oh, a lot yeah. of these signings were one year signings, Forget about the two, the two or three over 35 guys for a moment. The rest of them are one-year signings because that's how long the Rangers need them for. Right. Yeah. Because they're hoping Cooley, Othman, and I don't know who else. You know, maybe this kid, Sakara, who he's only uh, 18. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. He, he's got a motor. Yeah, he looked good in those clips from prospect camp for sure. Yeah, 
And and he looked good playing for them at, for Hartford at the end of the season last year. Mm-hmm. You know, he's a young kid, but he's been playing in the pro league in Slovakia. So he's been playing against men. Okay, they're not NHL caliber. And it's a bigger rink, but yeah, still. Yeah. Well, you know, it's kind of interesting. You were talking about the, the length of the deals, and, you know, that as much as all this talk about when, you know, we're in win now mode and things like that, and that's, you know, that's where all these sort of veteran signings are coming from, you know, your point makes them look a little more prudent than, than just that. It's like, you know, yes, we get these guys that we know theoretically are only going to be here for a year, and maybe they could be the missing piece of the puzzle, you know, to have a good run. But at the yep. same time, it allows us to – it doesn't – for you know, if often played really well in camp and you didn't have some of those veterans, you'd be like, well, we might as well plug them in, at, you know, second right wing because there's nobody – you know, there's no wheeler there who can right. play for us. And so now it's like, okay, we can kind of do the right thing and, and let them work on – you know, get used to playing with professionals and all that. And, time, uh, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and grew, you know, and and bring them up the way you kind of the way you know some of the other young guys probably you know should have been brought up and weren't. So, absolutely. Yeah. What about, absolutely. Uh, what about uh, Lafreniere? It, it, um, uh, he hasn't signed yet, has he? No, no. he has not. No. Okay. All right. I thought they were going to trade him at the uh, at the draft. I I fully expected them to trade him yeah. uh, uh, to. Um, to move up in the draft, but um, it, it didn't happen. But uh, to be honest, the way he's the way he's played, and some of that is the way he's been used as well. Um, I don't think they could get a first rounder for him right now. Okay, yeah, I agree. Certainly I agree. not higher in the draft than they than they were picking. No. You know, I mean. I, I just think that his value has fallen dramatically. Yes, some of it is on him, but it's also how he's been used. Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, let's not lose sight of the fact that, you know, it's taken Heedle, what, five years to get to this exactly. point. Exactly. Exactly. Right? And the my comment about Heedle is always, He's on the same timeline that Zabenejad was on in his career. Yeah. And Ottawa got into win now mode. They traded him to to acquire Derek Big Game Broussard. Right. And for a year or two, he played very well for Ottawa. He played with with them last season again after stops in multiple other places. But you know he's on at the end of his career, it, it right. doesn't pay to give up on a young, talented guy too soon. No. Yeah, I think that's exactly. I think there's a couple things. You're right. It's, it's what he would be worth right now, even regardless of where he was drafted or anything like that. You just look at his play by itself and, you know, what he could get you. But then you look at, okay, so that's one reason why I don't think you would trade him. The other reason is, like you just said, I mean, it's still – too early. You do. It's kind of, in a way, it's kind of a lot like the rest of the team that's been through two coaches now. Yep. Um, they, you know, this is going to be the third coach for Lafreniere, and it's going to kind of be, you know, okay. I mean, if, after a while, you know, how many times can you blame different coaches for your own play? You know, or and in a way, it's really not the coach's fault that we have Kreider and Panarin on left wing. I mean, that's that's you well, know that's. That's really nobody's. That's actually a good thing, right? When you look at it that way, yep. it's a good thing. But it's just a frustrating thing when you have somebody when you don't you don't have like if we had two if we had a third line center and a third line right winger that were almost as good as your second line, then it wouldn't matter. But the problem there's a pretty significant drop off to from second to third line as far as scoring and time on ice and all this other stuff. You yeah. know, So I think so. Lafreniere doesn't have the benefit of playing. You know, and then the power play as well. He doesn't really play as much. Hopefully, maybe he'll play more this year. But I think you really have to see, like with everybody else, you got to see how he does under Laviolette. And 
Um, I don't. I still. I, people still throw out the idea of him playing right wing, and you know, switching over. I, I, I don't see that happening. I, I don't. I think it's. I, I guess it could happen. I guess if you really want, I they really want to put him in the top six, but I don't see that happening right now. I, I think, as you mentioned earlier, Wheeler is going to be one of your top six right wings. Kako right. is going to be the other one. Right which leaves Lafreniere to be the third line left wing. And the question is, who's the center going to be? Right. Is it going to be Heedle or are they going to push Heedle into the number two center role and make Trocek the third line center? That's what well, I would now, do. I, I that's would do what I would do. And not only that, I would take it one step further just not permanently, <laughs> not not in stone, but the idea of Kreider playing with Trocek and VC, let's say, on the third line and putting Lafreniere on the left wing and Kako on the right of Zibanejad, I would have, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say no to that. I'm not saying that's the answer. No, but I, that, that, right. uh, that would not, the only thing that's ever bothered me about that proposal, and it's probably unfounded, is the fact that now you're paying a third line left wing six and a half million dollars. But if you can, but you know whether that matters to people, I don't know. It always it always pops into my head when I think about it. But if you put that aside and just talk about on ice best fit where these guys could play, I think that I think Kreider and Trotter, I mean they played really well at times together. So they they fun. played very well together last season. Yeah. Um, Kreider's going to get his goals in the power play. That's mm-hmm. not going to change. Um, right. I think it would do Lafreniere well to play with Zabanajad. And for that matter, what about what about a lineup where you have Zabanajad with Lafreniere and Wheeler? Yeah, sure. Why not? And then then you have Panarin with Hedel and Kako. Yeah. And exactly. you've got Kako and Hedel who've played together. Yeah. So, you know, the right and, wing and, would work. Yeah, and Heedle and Brad have clicked together when they play. We were just watching today. They showed the Ranger-Devil game from early in the year when Heedle got the overtime goal. I mean, yeah. you know, it's like – but I, and they play together more than just that game. But, yeah, that's a, that's a really good one because you've got sort of like cross-pollination familiarity. <laughs> you know, two, one side of, you know, the center and your right wing have played together and then the center and the different left wing – so, you know, the only guys that really didn't play together very much are Kako and Bred. Um, but, you know, between, with Heedle being in the middle, that would sort of transition that whole, you know, line, basically. Yep. And, and, it, and again, I come back to it as far as Lafreniere goes. Let's all not forget, because of COVID, he missed his entire final season of junior. Mm-hmm. Okay. And he played in a delayed World Junior Tournament. They won the gold. He was one of the best players that year for Canada in the World Juniors. And then he had to jump right to the NHL. Mm-hmm. Because they weren't going to start the number one overall pick in Hartford. Right, right. Okay. What do you what do you so, think about his, his foot speed? I mean, that's the knock on him sometimes is his skating. What do you what do you think about that? Do you, I mean, well, he he, he needs a center who can carry the puck. He needs right. to play with people who can carry the puck. And if Laviolette's game is to move the puck quickly via passes, he'll have time to get in there. Hmm. I was thinking. I was thinking more like on the forecheck. Like you know, you've got. Let's say he was playing with. Uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, on the third line, and you have the center and him sort of coming yep. in, and you know, being being able to get in on the defenseman, but then also if the puck gets past him, you know, get back that kind of thing. If, you know? I'm less worried about him forechecking than I am about him coming back defensively should the puck escape the zone. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's coming back that I worry about foot speed. Okay. Right. Yeah. Well, the good thing um, is when you're a wing, when you're a winger, you don't have to come back as far, which is nice as opposed to yep. you know, being a center, center. So you just have to get back to the blue line. 
but um yeah i just i mean i i don't think i don't think it's i don't think necessarily you know it's not really a, a detriment as i think it's just compared maybe compared to others it's like a relative thing i think maybe he's just you know he's yeah that's not one of, that's not one of his i wouldn't i wouldn't call it one of his strengths but you know he's got great hands he, he had several deflection goals last year he had you know obviously you know some of those insane move goals last year he's got so, he's got tons of skill yeah again he needs a little time and space and depending on who he plays with he'll get yeah, it exactly and again him with wheeler wheeler's a big guy wheeler will make some space for him Zabanajad mm-hmm. speed will make some space for him Mhm. Yeah, that's true. So, anyway, yeah, right. it's just a matter of will. Yeah, you know, I it's it's. I think it's not a question of will they sign him. Uh, I I think it's just how much it's going to cost, and maybe that's the holdup. You know that that Lafreniere and his agent are holding out, want more money than Drury wants right, to give them. Right. 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 Do you think uh, that's a, me, do you think that's know. legitimate? Sorry, George. Do you think that's um, I mean, on what on what basis could he hold that for a Well, um, the question is, I don't know how much he's asked for, and I don't know how much has been offered. But what else would be holding this up? Yeah, that's true. You know, unless unless he's asking for term, and if he asks for term, he's not going to be signing for big money. They don't have it anyway. Right. That's right. Yeah. 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 He, yeah. You know, or a, or a, no, no move contract. You know, might be looking for that. Right. And they don't want yeah. to do anymore. That was, that was, that was, that was Think about crazy. Igor for a moment, guys. Okay. <laughs> it's not that he got signed for chump change, but you know, five points in round numbers, five point seven million. For what was it, three or four years? It's, yeah. You know, it's for a guy of his caliber. He's won the Vezina. Yeah. So, you know, time to bet on yourself is how I would describe it. <laughs> yeah. I didn't actually realize that when when Quick re-upped with LA, he signed a ten-year contract that just yeah. expired last year. I forgot. I mean, I kind of remember that when it, but until I saw it again, I was like, "Oh my god!" That was, crazy. That was crazy. just well, you know, that was <laughs> during the cap era, but before they put the limit on a cap of a re-sign of eight years. Oh, okay. That was the previous CBA. Yeah. Anyway. Okay, here's what I'm afraid of, guys. Uh, I'm afraid Don't. that some, somewhere down, this, somewhere through the season. They're going to try to jam uh, Patrick Kane down our throats again. What do no. you think about that? I yeah, I I think it would be an awful thing, but uh, and I don't see where he would fit in. But that doesn't seem to matter sometimes to these people. So um, I just the question um, will be how much cap space is left, and how little would he be willing to sign for for the remainder of the season? Right. Right. Uh, I think at the moment, without um, without Lafreniere signed, Cap Friendly says they currently have about 2.3 million projected cap space, and Puckpedia says they have a little over 3 million, but you know. You still got to sign Lafreniere, and you got to yeah, think yeah. he's going to come in around two million. Right. So yeah. how? So how is the only way that's even an option? I think I've heard, you know, where you only use Kane for the playoffs where there is no cap. <laughs> I mean, is that isn't that the only? Because I agree with you. There's really not going to be much left to, for anybody after they sign Lafreniere. Pretty much. Yeah, but then you risk uh, you know, screwing up the uh, team's chemistry like you did this year. Exactly. Well, mm-hmm. what 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 screwed them up was, we you know we say the chemistry, but really what think about it if if he was Patrick Kane from three seasons ago, he wouldn't have been as big a detriment to the team. The problem was he was so beat up he just couldn't go. Yeah. Right. Okay. 
He yeah. had that one game towards the end of the season that he looked like his old self, but that was pretty much it. Yeah. And uh, so. What about yeah, Terrence Davis? Well, you think Terrence Davis deal anyway? You know, so I I, I just don't don't trust him, but. Uh, do you think Tarasenko's in the mix at all, George? As I told someone the other day, I've been watching this t- this team for more than sixty years now, and they have never called me up to ask me what to do. So <laughs> that makes two of us, George. <laughs> you haven't called George up either. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> no, they haven't. They haven't called me, and I've been watching this team for sixty years. I know. Since since. Uh, this February, it was 60 years yeah. since I went to the first game at the Old Garden. Well, thank you, guys. You guys are making me feel nice and young. Yeah, cool. you're, you're a kid, Mark. <laughs> yeah. It's only been 54 years for me or whatever. Yeah. Mark, how, how bad am I? I learned to skate at Iceland in the Old Garden. Oh, yeah. really? The old wow. practice rink, yeah. Wow. George and I have talked about this. When I see those old photographs from the practice rink, yeah. I I see the windows at the 8th Avenue end of the garden in those photos, and it reminds me of being there as a 10-year-old kid with the sun streaming in through those windows <laughs> during the daytime. Yeah. That's cool. That's that was cool. East, yeah. Yeah. All right, guys. I, anyway. I, I thank you very much. Uh, we're running out of time here. As usual, um, I thank you very much for coming on. This was a great podcast. We had a great conversation, and I hope we can do it again um, real soon. So Sounds thank good. you for coming on. Thank Sounds you, George. Good. Appreciate it. Yep. All right. Uh, uh, thanks for listening, everybody. This has been the uh, Retro Rangers podcast with Mark, with George Grimm, Mark Weissman, and Rich Isaac. Bye-bye. Okay. Well, gentlemen, thank you for uh, yeah, another good conversation. It felt, felt even smoother than last time, I thought. It was like kind of know each other's styles and stuff. Yep. Good. Yep. Did George hang up? Apparently. I guess so. <laughs> I guess he was like, I thought maybe he just hit stop on the recording. <laughs> That's what I thought he'd done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All, right. All right, Mark. All right, well, yeah, have a good evening. Easy. Yeah, thanks. This is take great. care. We'll, yeah. we'll no doubt talk next time. Absolutely. Take it easy. Take care. Bye. The proceeding has been a comfortably zoned network production. You are advised to keep your dreams wet your humor dry, your children and grandchildren out of military recruiting offices and off the laps of clerics who wear dresses. Thank you for listening, everyone. Happy trails.